we'll uh, resume our discussion on probabilistic graphical models and uh, the idea was that we wanted to start modeling structured in the among the variables want to do away with the iid assumption independent and identically distributed assumption just to uh, further uh, give more motivation for this um, several of you must have used the autocomplete option in your whatsapp right in fact uh, we have a tutorial problem exactly on this autocomplete problem right so if you are typing something like happy b i r right what would you complete it to birthday right uh, as a whatsapp message and now i think whatsapp has got more sophisticated you can also put in in fancy images and icons right? so how is this happening well all of you know that you could build a try structure to help complete right suggest possibilities but then uh, certain completions are more interesting more relevant are more uh, relevant in your context than certain other auto completions so this is a classic example of a uh, structure in the among the variables so think of these variables think of these as variables each character can be a variable each word can also be a variable so based on a word you may suggest the other word next word based on few characters you may suggest the next character depends on what your random variables are okay so x1 x2 and so on these are not independent what graphical models help you is um, help you give probabilistic semantics to graph structures and help you leverage algorithms that you have learned on graphs that could be used for such probabilistic families characterized to graphs so therefore it's the really the intersection of probability theory and graph theory and uh, uh, i want kind of refresh more and very important point here was that it's the absence of edges that's more informative that we care about than the presence of edges the presence of edges in some sense as mentioned here is vacuous i mean it really doesn't make a big difference and i'll develop on this further today so i i said that the extreme case is that of a completely connected graph so let's say i'm trying to predict characters or words and these are all the possible words that i could think about and i say well i give you the structure so basically saying any word can follow any word any character can follow any character is it helpful i mean uh, it doesn't right in fact even the try structure that you might build might at least capture previous occurrences right so this is not helpful this is the, the, therefore this is a redundant redundant graph in the sense it contains redundant information so i showed this as an example of an undirected graph i could also give you a directed graph i could also add some interesting additional structures here for example x4 could link from both x2 and x1 okay, so um this is a directed graph whereas something like x1 x2 x3 is an undirected graph you could also have a tree here x4 you could also have combinations of these edges some directed some undirected and we discussed in the last class that there are two ways of specifying such distributions one is in terms of absence of edges and the other is in terms of factorization okay so this is um the dropping of edges now you could also factorize i can in this case i'll say probability of x1 x2 x3 x4 
equal something in the undirected case which will be equivalent to this representation. Likewise, I will also give this joint distribution in the undirected case. Now, what are those? So, in the directed case, it is a distribution over the children given the parents. Okay. So, x4 is a child of x2 and x1 x3 is a child of x2, x2 is a child of x1. So, this joint distribution is given as probability of x4 given x2 comma x1, probability of x3 given x2 into and all this is product, probability of x2 given x1 into probability of x1 given its parents which is empty set. Okay, so, this is characterization of an undirected graph, so a directed graph. Now, you can verify that this characterization is a proper probability distribution, it is normalized. Right? Normalization means that if I sum it across all values of x1, all values of x2 and x3 and x4, then the sum should be equal to 1. In the undirected case, however, you we do not talk in terms of um, parents and children because the relationships are somewhat symmetric, they just are not directed. Okay. Um, let me add a little bit, make this a little bit more interesting. Let me make let it let me put a edge between x3 and x4. Okay. So, I could have cycles as well. Now, how would I characterize the joint distribution? In the case of uh, directed, undirected graphs, it is a product over all the maximal cliques in the graph. So, you all know what a clique is, right? Set of edges, a set of vertices which are completely connected. This, for example, is a clique. This is another clique. It is also, this is also a clique. This x2, x4 is also a clique. But is it a maximal clique? The edge x2, x4 is part of a larger clique. Okay. So, let us list the maximal cliques in this graph x1, x2. Now, you could think of x1 also as a clique, I mean individual nodes, but we are interested in maximal cliques x1, x2, x2, x3, x4. These are the maximal cliques. So, this characterization says I am going to take a I am going to take a product of potential functions. Think of these potential functions as feature functions, generalization of feature functions phi. So, these potential functions a product, but where are these potential functions measured? There is one potential function for every maximal clique. So, one for x1, x2, another for x2, x3, x4. Okay. So, it is xi x1, x2. It is a subscript here, which means it could be defined based on the structure of x1 and x2, what x1 and x2 represent. So, xi x1, x2, x1, comma, x2, the, the specific values that these arguments take will determine the, the value of the. Uh, the potential function into xi x1, x2, x3, x4, x1, x2, x3, x4. This is a product over all the maximal cliques. Ah, sorry. I'm, I'm x2, x3, plus x2, x3, x4. Okay. So, do you understand what maximal cliques are? So, uh, you understand what a clique is, right? Set of vertices which are completely connected. I mean, every word, uh, uh, there is an edge between every pair. Now, maximal clique is a clique such that every other clique 
will belong to this maximal case. So the the x2, x4, x3, the, the cliques x2, x4, x2, x3, these are also cliques, but they are part, these edges are part or this, uh, the set of edges in the in other cliques are a subset of the edges in the maximal cliques. Okay, so this is like completely maximally connected, completely connected set of vertices. Okay, so this is maximally connected subset of vertices, this is another maximally connected subset of vertices, is that, let, let me know if it is not clear, this is fundamental. Okay, so the semantics we will get to, uh, just hold on, but is this clear, the maximal cliques? All we are saying is, for every maximal clique, I have an index, this index, this index, based on which I can define a potential function, potential function xi, and think of this as generalization of feature function. Feature functions took an example x1. Now, these potential functions can take multiple examples. What would be examples of potential functions? We will come to, I will take a very concrete example. This is the most generic definition. So, all you need to do is define these potential functions over the maximal cliques, take a product over all of them, right. Now, is this normalized already? Yes, it is like a density function, I mean uh, uh, density functions are, are, are actual density functions only when they are properly normalized. So typically this is not all you do, you will ha you'll have to, you will have to additionally normalize. So it is just safe to say that this is proportional to, which means you need, we need to additionally ensure that normalization is happening. So, if you want to ensure that that is normalization, what you will do is x1, x2, x3, x4 equals 1 upon z into. Now, what is this z? So, we will have to define this z as a normalizer. Okay, so z is nothing but summation for all configurations of x1 and x2 and x3 and x4 of the product of these potential functions. Now, let us list some possible xi's so that should probably help answer your question. What would be interesting examples of these xi's, the potential functions. And let us, let me take the oldest uh, example, the icing model. So, icing model, uh, undirected model, which was uh, meant to model electron spins, positive negative, right, which direction the electron is spinning, right. And you know that a stable configuration is that which minimizes or maximizes energy, minimizes energy. So, potentials should be high when the directions are compatible, right. So, let me take the, uh, the uh, so this is exact, I mean we can go revisit this happy birthday or this auto completion example, but I uh, will also look at this. But let me take the icing model. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, in the case of electron spins, so the, the, let's say there's some structure, and each x1 or each xi can be say plus one or minus one. 0 1 another possibility plus 1 or minus 1. Now, what would be a natural uh, choice of xi? Give me some choice of xi. Do not worry too much about normalization because that is the headache of z. We will take care of that externally. Okay. So, if they are of the same uh, value then put it as 0, exactly 0, you are multiplying. So, his suggestion was to make it, make the potential 0 if they have the same spin. Be a little careful there because one, even one pair will now push the whole thing to 0. The, Okay, so his question is, uh, I talk, I, I, where I, when I began I said we want energy to be minimized, right, but here are we measuring energy, what are we looking at, the like, the probability or likelihood, right. So, we will take care of that later, we know that cross entropy corresponded to maximum likelihood in some setting, right. So, we will similarly assume that energy minimization will correspond to likelihood maximization. So, let us not worry about energy right now, let us think about the likelihood. What likelihood should be most probable? Electrons with same spin together or uh, spin should be op opposite? Opposite. So, th so, design your potential so that the probability of opposite spins being together on, on an edge is minimized, but try and avoid zeros. So, as a hint you could also consider exponentiated forms, I mean instead of just directly having x1 into x2 or x, I mean you could also have e raised to something, sorry, e raised to the difference in x size, uh, absolute value of the difference, how about just the e raised to the negative of the product or something like that, e raised to minus of x1 in x i into x j. sigma of difference or that is just a product. Ok, so uh, xi x i x j, I use it, xi x i x j for example could be just e raised to minus x i into x j. So, if x i and x j have opposite signs, the, uh, is it correct? If they have opposite signs, then likelihood basically increases, the potential basically increases. This one, one, one choice. In the happy birthday case, I mean the, the auto completion case, what, what could be your graphical model, what could be your choice of xi? Let us say I am looking at auto completing words, not characters. Let us keep it simpler. So, I want to predict what is going to be the next happy blank. Huh? Okay. So, uh, I want to increase the likelihood of things that I uh, have seen earlier occurring. Uh, now, question is should it should we model using a directed graph? Uh, not necessarily, 
but uh, I think what, what you are intending is that we seem to be writing from left to right, right. So, so just makes sense that x i determines x i plus 1 rather than x i plus 1 determining x i, but uh, it is not necessarily that way because you, we have all I mean you could also actually have a fill in the blank style question generated using a model right, blank birthday. So, you you want you might want to guess happy. So, it is uh, the choice you have choices both ways and it turns out as you will see very soon that um, unless you have some very interesting cyclic phenomena directed and undirected models will turn out to be the same equivalent ok. So, so here there is some cycle here like I mean, but uh, if it is just a sequence whether you use directed or undirected may not make a difference. So, uh, we will keep that aside for the time being and uh, focus a bit on des uh, on designing your xi. What would be an interesting feature uh, I mean potential function xi ok. So, x 1 is a random variable now how many values can it take? Is it just plus minus 1 x i? What is it now? x i belongs to a big vocabulary and v could be uh, say 1000 word vocab dictionary. dictionary. So, what would be an interesting uh, feature function uh, potential function here? Frequency of occurrence of a, of a pair of words. Let us say I, I go to Google and fire a pair of words as a query. What does Google tell you? How many hits? this query will uh, have right, which one? So, so the, I, I, the problem in happy birthday is I want to fill blanks ok. So, I, I give you happy birthday and I want to you to guess what the next word is. So, typically what the, would that be? Dear or something right, dear and the name of the person. So, dear and uh, or just a person name, it could also just be a person name. You may not be able to guess the actual name of the person, but you could guess the get the person name from the from the uh, the trail right your uh, log chat log the person whom you are chatting with. I mean that is how chat bots should uh, uh, suggest right. Have you used these features in chat bots in whatsapp in google as you are writing gmail as you compile uh, compose an email do you find some segments coming up automatically right. So, this is the kind of fill in the blank we are talking about. And these words have to come from vocabulary, some vocabulary. Now, the vocabulary can keep dynamically changing. Let us simplify the setting and assume that we are just talking about a fixed vocabulary, a fixed dictionary. Is that clear? That is a problem setting. So, my random variables are x1, x2, which have as many values as the size of the vocabulary. So, I was asking you what would be an interesting potential function. So, one potential function could be frequency. So, let us design some. Now, frequency you have to be a bit careful. What if frequency is 0? You will, the probability will go the entire product will go to 0 right because you are dealing with products of such size. So, keep that in mind we can list that as one frequency what else So, so he uh, what is being suggested is you could do some smoothing ok. So, there are different smoothings possible, but all these smoothings correspond to priors. So, you can basically use these lit stone Laplace priors. So, to so that 
you don't use them as frequencies, but frequency plus some delta. So you can do that fine. So some uh, kind of adapted a uh, frequency adaptation. What else could be a uh, psi? Does it make sense to have uh, um, an adverb followed by an adjective? So I, I might say happily, I, I happily sang, right? So I can have happily which is an adverb, everyone understands adverb, right? So happily sang, that is adjective, uh, sorry, adverb followed by a verb. But can I have happily wonderful, I mean happily wonderful uh, scene, does not make sense. So certain parts of speech, these are called parts of speech, do not follow certain other parts of speech. I mean it just makes sense to put in some common sense into the eyes. okay. So one example is, you can actually put discourage, uh, you can discourage, zero if xi is adverb and xj is adjective, okay. actually I should just call it xi xi plus 1, xi xi plus 1, so these are possibilities. So you do not have to necessarily only put frequencies, you can also put in your world knowledge. Is this second example clear? Very simple, we say we, we push or we discourage cases of meaningless composition, right? Uh, so zero or something very small, discourage basically. Again, I mean as I said all of them you could suitably threshold or or exponentiate, you can take it e raised to something like we did for the IC model. But the spirit is that we are putting in structural information into the Zeiss. Is this clear? I hope you, this is just to illustrate what Zeiss could be. And uh, the qu uh, qu question was, uh, are we now in encoding information of what follows what? Are we doing that indirectly here? So we are saying that uh, adverbs, adjectives should not come after adverbs by design of such a potential, we are discouraging, right, wonderful after happily, right. So happy birthday, so after, immediately after happy birthday, would you have an adverb, happy birthday happily, does not make any sense, happy birthday wonderfully, does not make any sense, right? so you discourage an adverb after a noun, birthday is a noun, so this, uh, so I mean, I can't, I do not want to keep writing all these, but so what you won't have here is say happily or wonderfully or nicely, these are discouraged here. Okay. So frequency is not sufficient, you will need to put in more information. So this is the basic idea, um, can I move on? Are there any questions at this point? This is very important understanding how you can define uh, Zeiss so that you can make meaningful distributions. Uh, excellent question. So his question is, uh, are we being redundant here by saying an adverb cannot come before an adjective, whereas in our vocabulary or in, in the observations we have made so far, this phenomenon, these bad phenomena would have never occurred. Why are we overdoing? Okay, that was his question. So twofold answer, one is it could happen that your corpus or your logs have some noise. 
somebody typed something wrongly and let's say we are just learning from everyone not necessarily people who are uh, grammatically sound so we also want to be robust to noise that's one reason a second reason is please try and understand uh, uh, it's not just frequency frequency is only one of the I mean, could be one maybe there are 20 such things and maybe there are five others which encourage uh, such bad phenomena right so it's it's like feature functions right one feature could be good but there may be 20 which are bad or misleading so you need to make sure that overall they are robust is that helpful okay and in general it's not a bad idea as if you have already encoded knowledge which is already there uh, because this is coming from a different perspective not from a frequency perspective but very good question yeah So, his point is, it is like imposing a prior to take care of the noise. That is another view of what we are doing, trying to do. Okay. Okay. So, now we get to the graph view, and that is what we call the Markov properties. So, the graph independence assumptions. And for undirected graphs, we talk of Markov property. So, we say that if a set of nodes, so let us say x, oh, uh, here, uh, the, the undirected was here, yeah. undirected. So, in this case, x1, x2, x3, x4, x2 blocks the flow from x1 to x3 or x4 right if i if i if i kind of choke the information flow at x2 information from x1 will not flow to x3 or to x4 is that correct so intuitively what we are saying is given x2 x1 is independent of x3 and x4 and vice versa this is called the markov property right two sets of nodes a and b are conditionally independent given a set of node c if and only if every path from a node in a to a node in b is blocked by a node in c so this is say c x2 is c x1 is a and uh, x3 and x4 are b so we say that x1 is conditionally independent this is a notation used conditionally independent of x3 comma x4 given x2 given today's temperature tomorrow's temperature is independent of yesterday's temperature so today kind of blocks the flow of information from yesterday to tomorrow and vice versa. So, this x1 is your A, x3 and x4 put together are the B and x2 is C. So, this is called graph separation. For those for, of you who for whom this is clear, for undirected graphs now tell me what will the, what will it mean in the case of directed graphs and if there is a subtlety there could you just directly apply it to a directed graphs if it's not clear ask me i mean maybe in this process of inquiring you would also realize uh, your issues in your understanding of undirected graphs so undirected graph the idea is just message is blocked in the case of happy birthday nicely right whatever if I, if I told you what the current word is, the assumption there is, I will be able to predict the next word independent of what the previous word is, the word before birthday is. That is the assumption. Now, you may say, oh, that does not make sense. But that is the baggage that you have brought along with 
uh, this factorization. Or in the case of x1, x2, x3, x4. Okay, let's take this example also. This is also a case of undirected graph. So here we are saying that. So if I blocked x3, can information flow from x1 to x4? Yes, it can. What else do I need to block along with x3 so that x2, x1 and x4 become independent? Huh? So what else do I need to block? x2. So if I block these two, these are my C, then the flow of information from x1 which is A to x4 which is B is blocked completely. Okay, so in this case we will also say that x1 is independent of x4 given x2 comma x3. So you need to block completely, you can't just partially block. So if you have questions you can ask, if you do not have questions now tell me what would I do in the case of undirected graphs. Will the same logic be extended without any hassles or do you see some problems? Mm -hmm. If the question is if there are more than one vertices on the path from x1 to x4 and if there is something before just before x4. If there is one more here right. So you catch your neck, food will not go down, that is the idea. So how catch the neck? What is the neck here? So this, in this case the neck is pretty broad, but it could be that the neck is very narrow, you just need to catch one guy, that is possible. So if you have a source and a sink, the suggestion is why not just block the nodes uh, close to the source and close to the sink. Now really the question is also, what is independent? you are talking about independence between what? So if you are talking about independence between source and sink, then your logic is fine. But maybe the question is not about independence between source and sink. Maybe it is about independence between the sink and a node close to the sink. So this, this uh, the query can be any pair of nodes or any sets of nodes. I can give you any subset A, any subset B. Is the temperature in December, all the days of December independent of the temperature in all the days of November, just which is one month earlier? We will say, well, no, no. If I give you information about the last month, last day of November, then I could talk of some independence. So you can have queries on sets. If this is clear, I need the whiteboard, so I'm going to, I need to erase it. If this is clear, let me know and please start working on what would you do here in the case of directed graphs. For directed graphs from A to B and B to A both because you are talking about directions, directed edges. So he's saying because we have directed edges, path from A to B, B uh, being blocked doesn't mean that path from B, B to A is blocked. So both ways, that's one thought. Any other concern? So his suggestion was, don't look at only paths from A to B. Look at also paths from B to A because it's directed. Just blocking A to B will not ensure that B to A is blocked. I mean, imagine you have. You have uh, the railway track right from here to Delhi, it is it's really one way. So blocking the track from here, uh, from Mumbai to Delhi will still allow Delhi, I mean tra trains from Delhi to come to Mumbai. Right? So you need to blo block both the paths, bo both, uh, uh, both the routes, so there are two routes and both have to be blocked. So you have to make sure that, that is his suggestion, I am not saying, I am not completely agreeing with that, we will come to that. Um, 
you his point is if you have to show independence between a and b given something that independence has to be both uh, bidirectional right see here the claim was x1 is independent of x4 given x2 and x3 which means x1 is also independent of x1 this claim of independence is symmetric okay so good uh, i mean good that this question came up so x1 x4 i i, I can also rewrite this to be x4 independent of x1 i can also write this to be x4 independent of x1 okay so that's why it's, it's good to just talk about a set x1 independent of the set okay let me put it here itself x1 is independent of the set x3 comma x4 that's one and the second is this is equal to x3 comma x4 independent of x1 given x2 the other the other way as well okay okay so i'm going to now give you uh, examples for the directed case so far we took more examples for the undirected case so i'll consider these three cases x1 x2 x3 x1 we put x2 here Consider these three cases. This for directed case. All these are for directed case. So X one could be, for example, the temperature Tuesday temperature. X two could be Wednesday temperature and Thursday temperature. okay that's an example the second what would be an example for the second case some x2 determines x1 and x3 so chromosomes you are aware of chromosomes right so there is a father chromosome and mother chromosome right Ah, that will be the third example. Good. <laughs> what would be an example in the second case? Well, if if mother has, uh, if uh, father has two kids, mother has two kids, so then that will be the second case also, right? The the chromosome being influenced by one of the parents for two children. Okay. So mother chromosome. This is a brother chromosome and sister chromosome. Is that correct? Pardon? Uh, father or mother chromosome also affects, right? No? Okay. So, okay. Any case. So, there is one, one hidden cause which gives rise to two outcomes. I mean let us take a simpler example. So let us say I have, so I have coins, multiple coins and uh, oh, my daughter took away all my coins. Okay. So, um, so x2 could correspond to the choice of the coin right and x1 could correspond to the probability of heads in each coin, in that coin right, the first coin, x3 the probability of heads in the second coin. So let me take a simpler example. Uh, so x2 would be 
coin 1 or coin 2 which one am I, am I picking once I pick x1 is heads tail probability in, in coin 1 and x3 is head tail as per coin 2 okay. So, once um, so this is the second case this is clear once I pick a coin from the 2 I toss then it is only that coin that determines the heads and tail probability. Third case third example. So, what is the color you see on the screen here? I mean di different colors. So, there is there is a dark blue and then there is a very light blue right. So, different colors you see on the screen. What is the color of the film in the projector? I mean you would like it to be transparent you did not you do not want but imagine putting a blue film what what will be the effect? change the color to red film what would be the effect the color that you see on the screen would change is that correct so x1 is say this color of the ink or the color of the board right the color that is being projected and x2 is the medium which through which you are projecting color of the medium uh, x3 and what is x2 the output color Okay, so okay. Now tell me uh, what independence could you think about in each case. What is the blocking of information from x let us say x1 to x3. So, in all the three cases I am uh, let us say my query is standard x1 is independent of x3. Is it independent of x3 given x2? That is my question. In the first case, is the Thursday temperature independent of Tuesday temperature given Wednesday temperature? Does it make sense? Okay, so we will start ticking off. So, in the first case, it just looks obvious. The second case, is it clear? The first case is clear to everyone. The second case, Amongst two coins, I toss, I pick one and then toss the one I pick. So, is x1 independent of x3 given x2? If I tell you which coin I have picked, the outcome from x1 and x2 are independent. So, this is also fine. So, in both cases, x2 blocks, I mean, in, uh, in congruence with our previous jargon. Third case, what happens? Suppose I tell you the color of color being projected. Sorry, suppose uh, I tell you the output color. Does the color being projected become independent of the color of the medium? Ordinary. So the answer. Some of the you are saying no. Let me ask another question. Ordinarily, is the color being projected independent of the color of the medium? Ordinarily, they are independent moment I tell you the color that I observe they become dependent you can't I mean I, I, I can't be observing white here whereas the color being projected is black and the film is red does not simply make sense right certain things are ruled out ok. So, in this case the answer unfortunately is a no. Is this intuition clear to everyone? What is happening? What is what do you see peculiar to the third case? I will just give these names. 
so in the case of directed graphs we say that c blocks the path from node a to node b if and only if a is independent of b given c and not otherwise okay so the first case we call it the head to tail node the head this is head to tail this is tail this is head this is a head to tail node and that seems to be consistent with our previous undirected case it blocks the path a is not independent of b ordinarily but a becomes uh, independent of b given c the tail to tail node okay this is the tail to tail the two tails here so this also blocks the path a and b are not independent ordinarily but moment i give you c they become independent the there's a third one is called head to head node and this is the problem case or the exception this unblocks the path so moment i tell you x2 information starts flowing from x1 to x3 by knowing the value of x2 not by not knowing the value okay a and b are independent otherwise uh why are a and b so the now the observation i have let's say two coin tosses i make right x1 x2 so these are two coin tosses now which which uh, observation i make in the two will depend on which of the coins was to tossed in each case right there is a latent variable which determined what was to to tossed in each case so they are not independent because they are dependent on what that e the, the outcome of x2 determined x1 and x3 so, so uh, the two things first is graphical model the second is the example i am giving now example i am giving uh, is roughly approximated by this graph even in the case of temperature on tuesday wednesday thursday you can have the same argument how can you say that today's temperature is completely independent of day before yesterday's temperature so the graph is kind of approximately representing the belief system associated with the real world right so the example i am giving just to illustrate so that it it makes sense so the two co two coin tosses i have are coming from a latent model and therefore they are not independent of each other ordinarily in the ordinary case mm -hmm. i mean let's yeah brother sister example right so if there is a brother chromosome or, uh, and a sister chromosome that's influenced by they are not independent ordinary uh, i mean they are uh, they are not independent ordinarily brother chromosome and sister chromosome they they have something latent that governing them right which one coin okay so uh, if, if you don't like coin i'll go back to brother and sister chromosome fine <laughs> so this is an assumption so this mod graph is kind of assuming something though it is also i mean i would think it's 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 a reasonable thing but uh, let's let's go back to the uh, father chromosome brother chromosome and sister chromosome so this helps so so he is uh, i i think one uh, point is he is trying to think in terms of actual values that the ex, uh, the probabilities of heads and tails would have and he is assuming a fair coin now if the coin is not fair then there will be issues you will show dependence so even in the case of coin you can show the dependence if the fair, fair coin is not fair but the, i mean this i think this is uh, more natural so let's go back to our earlier example okay so is this clear to everyone is this clear no there is some something latent governing these two outcomes that's the point in uh, 
in a tail to tail node okay so head to head node there's nothing latently governing the the color of the film and the color of the, uh, the original color they are independent but once i view the color being projected they become dependent okay so this is the difference so uh, so if i had to write down what exactly happens here so this independence for tail to tail and head to tail right this is fine but not for head to head so i mean you can come up with cases for the the coin tossing so coin tossing also the in general should hold okay but uh, uh, i don't want to get stuck in that example right now okay so in general uh, i mean this is a lot of this is from my notes directly a set of nodes a in a directed acyclic graph is d separated so there's a notion of d separation and what is this d separation a is d separated from set of nodes b by set of nodes c if and only if every undirected path from a vertex a to a vertex b is blocked an undirected path between a and b is blocked by a node c either if one uh, c is part of this calligraphic c and both edges on the path are directed away from c right that's a tail to tail node or you have a head to tail case or if for all head to head nodes so this is important for all head to head nodes c is not a part of the set so you don't want head to head nodes to be a part of your blocking set that is the idea so summary of this is so we need tail to tail nodes and head to tail nodes in the blocking set c but no head to head node in blocking set c the so same point now we are talk, trying to give an algorithm in fact this is the idea behind an algorithm called the baseball algorithm b a y e s base okay, not baseball okay so okay you could play baseball in the next lab okay so it's very important to understand this difference two sets of node are a conditionally independent given a set of node c if the blocking happens by a node c okay i'm going to give you some example queries uh, uh, so here's there here are some quiz problems for you okay what about the following so please pay attention here so the first example is a independent of b given c how many of you say it's independent yes a is an independent of b given the shaded c yes so what's the idea behind uh, independence every path must be blocked now think of paths here as undirected paths okay don't and the path in the sense the flow has to be through any so now think of this also as a path from x1 to x2 so x2 x1 to x3 x2 blocks the flow from x1 to x3 okay so this is a path think so think of the paths as undirected paths but the blocking is based on directions okay so i just want to write that note down
important. Blocking will be based on direction. So what would happen here? So how many of you believe that the answer is yes? Yeah, what is your reasoning? Uh, what is blocking? E. E is blocking the path. So a, first of all, any information from A to B has to go through E in the indirected sense also. And even if you think, now you somebody may say, I will think of this E to C as two undirected edges, I mean two di uh, directed edges. Somebody may think of, that is also fine. Think of E to C as leading to a tail to tail node in C. So think of two tails as coming, I mean if you want, okay, here E to C and then back to E. But even in that case, the path has to go through E only, the path from A to B. In all cases path from A to B is through E and E is blocking. Is that clear? No? Hmm. Right. So, all paths are going through E, but the problem is now because there is a C which is known, is that influencing the E? Right. Your answer was yes, but that is based on ignoring the influence of C on E. But there is an influence that C has, that is the point, right, you are making. C is influencing the behavior of E. So, that goes against the reasoning I articulated. Okay, so A E C F B. Okay, so what's happening here is C is a head to head node. There is only one head, but it is a head to head node. Okay. So, C is unblocking. C is not blocking, it is unblocking. It is exactly the case, the head to head case here. And that unblocking has an effect on E unblocking the information from A to the rest of the graph. Yeah, this is one node. So, if you had to traverse, so I am giving an intuitive explanation. Okay. So, if you have to traverse this way, you would have to traverse from the head through another head. The traversal will require a head to head view of C. So, when you going this way, you are seeing head, incoming head, when, when you enter, when you exit also you are seeing an incoming head into C, right. So, think of it that way. I mean, or in general, just take it from me that this is uh, the effect of C being known is to unblock, C certainly unblocks and also unblocks E. So, the unblock is basically uh, being pushed up, the unblocking effect is being pushed up. 